Right, welcome, welcome back everybody. We're, we're pretty much on, on schedule for the second half of the morning. Um, and uh, we always used to think that Chateau Huyuk was the oldest site in the world, but in fact it's been upstaged, at least chronologically, by both the uh, uh, presentations that we're going to be hearing uh, in uh, between now and lunchtime. Um, and it's uh, a great pleasure to me to introduce uh, Dr. Lee Clare, who I've just met, but uh, well met for coming, um, uh, now based in, in Istanbul and is going uh, with the German Archaeological Institute uh, uh, in Istanbul and to talk to us about um, a site which actually I, I, I do recommend credit to myself that I invited Harold Hauptmann, who was the first excavator and almost discoverer of Gobekli Tepe in the mid-1990s to talk to an audience here in London on Gobekli Tepe, or at least I asked him to talk about Nevela Choro, which was the other earlier site, and he said, well, I could do that, but I've got something better for you. <laughs> um, and I think that was the first time that Gobekli Tepe got into the public consciousness in a very modest way in London. It's now, of course, a sort of a world sensation site. And um, I look forward to hearing archaeological research at the zero point in time. Yes. Wonderful title. Point. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Well, perhaps not such a wonderful title. The zero point in time is something that uh, I've obviously put here in your... Uh, it's something that I don't like to hear, the, the zero point in time, as much as I don't like to hear the, the, the first temples and, and the various other things that the site's been called, even ground zero, which is a bit dubious as well. Yeah. So um, I, I just really um, want to give you a lecture today, um, a bit briefly, about recent developments at the so-called zero point in time. And um, as you can see, I've got the first picture here showing two remarkable shelters. And I too could give a lecture on shelters, but I don't want to. This is something that um, has been ongoing now for the past few years. Um, I actually started at the project in 2013 as a postdoc. And in 2014, after Klaus Schmidt passed away, I was asked to take over, over the, the coordination of the research. And I'm, I'm still here. Um, I'm not the excavation director. The excavation directorship lies uh, with the uh, Shannon Museum, or did so until recently, and will pass soon to Nejmi Kabul from the University of Istanbul. Um, but at the same time, the German Archaeological Institute is uh, very much involved, or is key in uh, the research at the site. Uh, since 2009, we're being financed by the German Research Foundation, the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, in the long-term project, and we have another three years left in that project. And of course, again, as a chat of you, we have a, a series of, or a whole bunch of, um, uh, of sponsors and uh, uh, you know, stakeholders involved. Um, the official sponsor, oops, oh, no, no. turn it off. The official sponsor, for example, is Dorsch Group, who have um, uh, rights over the site for the next 20 years or so as sponsor. Uh, and of course, you have the Shannon Open Museum and the various uh, ministerial uh, institutions. So, um, just very briefly, the basics, I think most people are aware of what the site is, or more or less what the site looks like, and where it's located. Uh, the site itself is located in southeastern Turkey. Um, you can see here a, a map of the uh, border region. So here will be the uh, Turkey, and down here is northern Syria. We have the Euphrates coming here. Um, and here is the Haran Plain, and Kebeki Tepe lies in a, a so-called mountain range, I'd rather call them hills. Um, the Germush uh, Dalla, and is, uh, these are mountains or hills that flank on three sides the uh, uh, Haran uh, plain. Um, the site itself lies at 770 meters above sea level. You can see here the views are quite spectacular from the, spectacular from the site. Uh, looking north on, on a good day with good visibility, you can see the, the tourist mountains. Um, to the east, you can see the um, Kajida. Uh, volcanic massif, and to the south, of course, uh, and to the southwest, here is Ufa, uh, the Haran Plain, uh, down towards the south, and to the to the uh, border uh, with Syria on a good day. Visibility, uh, you know, 30, 40 kilometers is uh, is possible. The site here, you can see an aerial view of the site. 
uh, taken before the construction of the shelters. Um, this is the main excavation area here, um, and we have uh, trenches coming off over the southwest mound and the northwestern part of the site, the chronology of the, the research I'll show you in just a second. Um, it's not a perfect mound, it's not a symmetrical mound, it's a series of depressions or hollows and mounds or uh, you know, the summits. Um, but we'll see those in more detail in just a second. Of course, uh, what everyone knows from the site, of course, are these T-pillars arranged in circular uh, st structures with two central T-pillars um, up to five and a half metres in height. But as I say, I'll come back to the details in, in just a moment. Um, importantly, and I do this in all my lectures, stress that the site, because the site has been a sort of, uh, I don't know, misused, uh, it's been referred to you know, much as a smoking gun of immunization that you know, it all started here. And I think this is something totally misconceived and you know, we have to be aware that Gobekli Tepe lies within the whole process of the long delay of neolithization, which starts back in the Epipaleolithic and, and, and continues right into the Pottery Neolithic and beyond. So a long drawn out process, we are in the pre-Pottery Neolithic uh, and the site, uh, according to most recent radiocarbon ages that we have, does span a period of about 1500 years around 9,500 to 8,000 calibrated BC. So in an early part of this uh, long delay of mimetization. And they're spanning the PPNA, the early PPNB, and into the middle PPNB we think now. Yeah, um, the birth of religion, the uh, world's first temples, I'll say these are, are terms that I don't like because, just because of this, you know, and, and um, the fact that it was always said that, you know, it was the religion um, that now forced the organization, bringing the groups together to, to Gobekli Tepe, um, really required uh, victuals and, and uh, required that people more or less invented domestication to cope with this demand, and that uh, Gobekli Tepe is therefore the answer to the question of the Neolithic and Neolithization, and that's something that I, I strongly want to uh, relativize and actually I disagree with. Okay, looking back to the research history, we just heard about Herd Hauptmann uh, briefly, um, but the site itself was first discovered in the 1960s, in 1963, in the frame of a, um, a survey in the southeastern part of, of Turkey, undertaken by uh, Chicago University, uh, well, uh, the Oriental Institute in Chicago and also the University of Istanbul and those important names there would be Halep Chandel and uh, Braidwood and then of course uh, the site itself was uh, rediscovered as it were it was, uh, wasn't actually looked at any further at the time uh, in the mid-1990s uh, Harald Hauptmann was busy working um, in the 80s, early 90s in uh, Nevali Choi uh, since submerged Tipula site um, with Klaus Schmidt who was his uh, PhD student and uh, at the close of that excavation, when the Valley Choi became submerged, they set out to look for a new site, and Klaus Schmidt uh, came across the site of Gebekli Tepe. And uh, Harald Hauptmann became, together with the Shandu Wolfram Museum, Harald Hauptmann became uh, more or less the first excavation director at Gebekli Tepe in 1995. Um, and uh, was really, uh, when he retired in 2006, a position that was taken on then by Klaus Schmidt, who did most of the field work until that time, or did all the field work until that time. Um, yeah, more recently, and this is something that I can talk more about because, as I say, I, I began work there in 2013. Since this time, I've had a, a whole bag of things to do, which have really quite distracted from a lot of uh, academic research at the site. Um, of course, the most important thing being the UNESCO inscription or application in the inscription, uh, the construction of an exhibition center, um, the closure of the site, the excavations required for that, so deep soundings for the, the foundations of these shelters, which have revealed lots of new uh, insights into the mound. Um, and of course, more recently, um, the Gebekli <coughs> Tepe year, which has uh, seen a, a great influx of visitors and media attention to the site. And that's something that we've also, as an excavation team, have had, had to uh, cope with. I mean, the scale of media attention, I think everyone uh, more or less has heard of Gebekli Tepe now, um, but sort of this sort of thing, uh, these models, life-size models, uh, this one displayed at uh, the air new airport in Istanbul more recently, and this influx of visitors, but we'll come to those in, in just a second. So the UNESCO, I don't want to go into this in, in, in too much detail, um, but as you know, it requires a lot of work, um, and this was, uh, there were various institutions involved, um, of course the ministry was, was guiding this, this, um, this whole uh, process, 
uh, and of course we were advising, uh, the DAI was advising, together with other institutions in Germany. And we had our e-commerce evaluation in October 2017, and uh, we were inscribed at Manama in Bahrain in 2018. Of course, one of the concerns was expressed at the uh, nomination was also the fact uh, of the infrastructure, because of course, Istanbul, um, uh, uh, doesn't have the capacities or didn't have the capacities to cope with uh, the sort of influx of visitors that was planned. And, and this was one of the uh, worries um, expressed by the ICOMOS um, at the inscription. Um, but nevertheless, uh, the site was inscribed, uh, which we're very happy about. The site itself covers 587 hectares in the Gernosh Mountains. Uh, we have a first degree area, which is more or less this, uh, the main site with the surrounding plateau, and a buffer area around that, a third degree archaeological zone covered, covering a further 461 hectares. Um, inscribed according to three criterion, one, two, and three. Um, we'll go into those, uh, or the background to those, in, in just a moment. And I think the most important thing um, about the inscription and about the uh, whole visit by ICOMOS and also the, uh, the application was that we never actually said that the site was a site of the world's first temples. And we actually came and we moved away from this. And it was, it was one of my um, really, uh, this is the way I wanted it. I didn't want the site to go down with uh, UNESCO as the site of the first temple. And they were very keen on that. Um, and uh, we had good background, good uh, data to actually prove the contrary by that time. So we'll see that in just a second. This is the information center, which has been constructed recently by uh, Dorsch Group. Um, we can see here the site, it's about a kilometer away. Um, actually, you can see the whole process here of a visitor when he or she arrives. They arrive by bus or by car, which is left then here. They proceed into the, this is a ticket area, the restaurant um, and shop, souvenir shop. And then here we have an information center, an exhibition center, where we have uh, various sort of very mod-con swipe screen uh, things to look at, um, uh, like a, a surround sort of 180 degree cinema experience where you can immerse yourself in, in various sounds and uh, visuals um, of the story of Gebekli Tepe, something I think for the younger generation. Um, and then, um, yeah, various uh, reconstructions. The best thing is that we are involved or were involved in advising um, with regard to, to the concept or at least the information at this information centre. And the best thing is that we can change it accordingly. Um, and it's quite easy, especially as a lot of the swipe streams, obviously you can program them and you can sort of put text in. Um, so it's not a great effort to actually change information as we need to in the information centre. Um, Even before, I mean, I'm talking about a lot of the pressures, especially on the team during this uh, process. Um, of course, this also involved any building work in this area also involved survey work. And we did survey work, obviously, um, at the site of the information center. And uh, the most interesting thing is that uh, the site of Gebekli is one of the few sites that has uh, also a basalt uh, source on its doorstep. Uh, it's all limestone. It's, it's, uh, it's a bit patchworky, uh, the whole Channel Wolfer region. Mainly limestone with a bit of basalt. The airport sits on basalt, for example. And one small area of basalt um, actually lies just to the west of Gebekli Tepe. And of course, this was an area that we were very interested in. And this gave us the opportunity to actually do some survey work um, in the area of the information centre on this basalt plateau. And we did some, find some tentative evidence for, um, for some quarrying down there. So, and of course we have the fines, basalt, um, grinding stones at the site as well. Um, so these are a lot of things that we're, we are actually uh, doing. And of course, as I say, compromises were made. Um, you do go to the, the visitor center and a reference is made to the zero point in time, to ground zero, to um, the first temples. But this is something that we've had to learn to deal with. Um, I, I think, um, obviously, the media or the, the tourism uh, sort of interests and academic interests, they must merge at some point and compromises must be made, and this is what we're doing um, here at Quebec <coughs> Tepe. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, these are then the new shelters, as you can see. Um, we had to do uh, various deep soundings under considerable time pressure at the time. Um, we had to protect the ruins, of course, which was a considerable uh, effort. Uh, the whole of the main excavation area was filled with sand sacks at the time. Um, we, uh, you know, wooden frames or, or
boxes were put over the, the uh, tea pillars. Uh, every effort was made to protect the site. Unfortunately, no damage was actually done um, during the whole construction process. Um, uh, so here, the bulk's in the way. I mean, we, do, we did have to jump quite a bit. Um, we were more or less accompanying the building works because it's, you know, sometimes it was then uh, realised that a bulk was in the way and had to be removed so that a, a metal girder could be sort of placed through it. So this involved a great deal of flexibility on our part. Here we have an impression of the, of the building works underway. This was a, a preliminary shelter in 2013, a wooden shelter which wasn't very good for the tourists. So there was lots of complaints about this because it was just all wood and the visibility was very poor. This then served as a construction platform for the Helter Skelter or the, the, the roller coaster that went up afterwards. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a very interesting time, especially working at the site uh, with these issues, with these demands being made. And of course, now we have the influx in visitors at the site. Now, um, it has been considerable. Uh, there were a lot of numbers in the press, you know, one million, two million. It wasn't that many, but it was still enough, I would say. Um, last year, 2019, from February to October, we had over 300,000 visitors, which is roughly per day over 1,000 people. Um, just recently, I found on the internet just the other day, yesterday, the day before, the most recent figures for 2019. Um, I think there was some disappointment that we weren't on, on you know, position number one, but we are on position number eight, which is 400,000 people this year, which is a considerable number of people. Um, you can see the car parks on certain days, by land days, so public holidays. We did have a, a problem with overflow car parking, with toilets, various things, and this is something that needs to be looked at in the future, which we are actually now looking at in the frame of a, a tourism management plan uh, together with the Ministry of Culture. So these are all important developments. And of course, actually working at a site, you have to learn how to work with, you know, when you're down here working in the, in the monument, um, actually dealing with these visitors that are sort of constantly pouring around. The noise level is extremely high. It's a very stressful uh, environment to work in. Um, everyone wants to speak with the archaeologists. So everyone is sort of shouting down, how are you, colleagues, and what are you doing? Um, and um, of course, you know, if you're actually walking around the site, you do get ambushed a lot and held for questions. Um, and so it's a matter of sort of uh, trying to work around that and finding, and this is something we're just actually sort of discovering how to do at the moment. It's sort of learning by doing, as it were. Um, so also a very interesting experience for all of those working at the site, especially if we're asked to move out of the way for a photo. That happens sometimes <laughs> as well. Uh, so that's the site now from, from the uh, west. You can see the... Um, this is then the uh, view from Orangic Village, which is the nearest village. You can he see here the path going, or the road going up to the site. Uh, we have here the visitor area, the basalt plateau. Beyond that, then the, uh, the site itself with the two new shelters, the limestone plateau, and everything that belongs to then the first degree uh, site. So far um, in the past, you know, since 1995, so the past uh, 25 years, similar to Chapaguluk, uh, a number of structures, so-called special built, I don't refer to, I, I refuse, as I say, to refer to them as temples. Um, we, we now prefer to use neutral terms such as structure, building. Um, and a total of eight buildings have so far been discovered, generally labelled uh, alphabetically from A to H um, in the order of their discovery. So eight so far, um, the majority of which, or the first A, B, C, D, um, and uh, G actually here in the main excavation area. So here we have, this is the actual area now covered by the shelter. So A, B, C, D and G is over here. The others are, are in other parts of the site. Um, and they are uh, E over here on the plateau, which is just the foundations really of one of these, or the carved foundations of one of these special buildings. Uh, the entrance to the site, um, we have F up here on the southwestern mound and H over here in the northwestern part of the site that was opened up uh, around 2010, 2011. The idea being that Klaus Schmidt wanted to see uh, or test his hypothesis that in the dips, or that the sh the sort of, I mentioned that it's a, a series of hollows and, and mounds, that in the hollows we have these special monumental buildings or larger monumental buildings, and on the, on the, on the mounds we have the rectangular structures, and that he could prove actually when he went into here, into the, into the northwestern hollow or depression, he found building H, and up here on the northwest mound, of course, and the rectangular buildings. Um, of course, around buildings and monumental buildings, he associated with uh, uh, PPNA uh, uh, 
phase of the site, which he referred to as layer three, and uh, layer two being the PPMB rectangular structures, and layer one being the um, sort of topsoil layer. But as we should see, this uh, sequence this, uh, uh, is no longer valid, and we've changed that now. We've actually abandoned that uh, sequencing. Um, he, or Klaus also had uh, various uh, work done uh, regarding uh, sort of ground penetrating radar. Um, this is one of the uh, sort of results that he uh, showed. We haven't had any work done on this since, um, but it's something I think we need to look into again. Um, what we see here uh, is the main excavation area here, as I showed you, and these anomalies here in the geo radar. Now, I think we have to be very careful with these. Based on this picture, it's been claimed that there are at least 20 further uh, structures, special buildings awaiting excavation. I can't count 20. And uh, it's also quite interesting to, to note that here in the northwestern uh, hollow depression where we have building H, building H doesn't actually tally with the shapes that you see in the geo radar. Now, our we don't quite know what's going on. I think we need to excavate more uh, to know because, of course, um, up here, excavations are very preliminary. Um, but I think uh, we don't necessarily need to be seeing buildings here. They could be actually sort of structures in the plateau that we're seeing and not actually buildings. If they were buildings, of course, this one would be extremely large, about 60 metres in diameter. So I, 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 we have to wait and see. But there are no plans to do any large-scale excavations now. We are concentrating on the main excavation area again um, because uh, one of the things that we have to realise is that none of these monumental buildings, none of these special buildings, has been excavated in its entirety in the whole 25 years. This is something we have to remedy in the coming three years if we can, or in the next phase of, of our project. I don't think we'll manage it in the next three years either. Um, so this is something for uh, upcoming projects. <clears throat> so the, I'll just go through a few characteristics of these buildings. Um, so they're usually constructed according to a round over ground plan. At the centre we have these larger T-shaped pillars of five and a half metres in height and smaller T-pillars around the outside. Um, there were never freestanding T-pillar circles. These are buildings um, and the uh, only freestanding pillars are actually those in the centre and the others uh, were incorporated into the walls. Um, some uh, T-pillars have uh, depictions, not all of them. Perhaps the most famous are those in building D which actually denote the, the pillars as representations of the human forms, the top of the T being the head and the shaft, the pillar. Um, we'll move on. And um, of course the other thing that's very interesting is that the, the fill, you know, were these buildings filled intentionally or, um, or buried um, or was there another explanation for that? And I think. Uh, these are things we have to consider. And uh, now we have also a picture from the plateau. Of course, a quarrying took place on the adjacent plateau as well. And this is how it's imagined in the museum. And this is some of the uh, one feature from the plateau. We have this negative of a large block taken from the, uh, from the quarrying area and these slots here, which probably would have been used uh, for wooden uh, stakes to prise out the or skip the limestone. So uh, the thing is, uh, and this is something I've been criticizing, but why has Quebec ever been referred to as a zero point in time and the home of the world's first temples? Firstly, uh, because of the absence of domestic buildings, the absence of water sources, the intentional backfilling of the special buildings as indicative of something special. Um, uh, feasting has always been put forward as an argument and the evidence for beer brewing. I'm going to take a look at those in more detail briefly because um, this is more or less the evidence for that. I mean, Klaus Schmidt. A lot of this, um, or all of these points, stem from his pen, as it were. Um, for those of you uh, that can't read German, he's saying here that there's no other explanation for buildings like this. They cannot have been domestic buildings. They must have been something other than domestic. Um, according to his water, uh, water was a problem at the site. Obviously, there was no running water up there on the plateau, but he was aware that they were um, cisterns um, uh, dotted around the plateau, and they still exist today and was still in use until recently by local uh, shepherds. And um, then, of course, the burial. He was pretty much certain that the buildings were rapidly buried after falling out of use, and that uh, in the course of this, large amounts of uh, animals were consumed and their remains thrown into the backfill of the buildings as part of that ceremony, as it were. And then uh, that, uh, yeah, these were collective work events. So let's go now 
Domestic buildings, I think we've found good evidence for those now. This is the northwestern part of the site, um, vertical views, his building H. And we're going to just briefly look in this area here and over here in DR2. These are trenches that were excavated in the course of the erection construction of the shelter here. Here we see this wonderful uh, sort of typical domestic, these domestic structures here known from other sites from the same period. We have concentrations of bone tools. We have bead production. Um, we have uh, stratified, uh, stratified, stratified floors um, and plaster floors, terraps, possible terrazzo floors. These have been examined at the moment in the laboratory. Um, so good evidence for repeated domestication or domestic settlement uh, and buildings at the site at one location. And these dating to PPNA, I mean, they were typical round structures. And we have overlying radiocarbon data um, from the uh, 10th millennium BC, Cal BC. And here a uh, comparison then from uh, northern Syria from the site of Jabal Ahmad. Um, and then uh, more recently we did a, a trench uh, for the water, so the rainwater drainage uh, of, of this shelter over this area. And then we came, we hit very fortunately wonderful uh, similar structures, similar date, um, uh, several structures, uh, midden deposits and also hearths. So uh, this being confirmed in all of these new uh, excavation trenches. Then we have, and this is what's forgotten a lot of the time, the monumental, the special buildings here in the centre are surrounded by these rectangular buildings. Um, and the most exciting thing is about these is we can see the transition from round to rectangular. For example, here this building, room 16, we have a, a plaza floor which is roundish, which was then changed into a rectangular structure. So we have this sort of transition from round to rectangular taking place at Gobekli Tepe. Of course, it wouldn't have happened overnight. And just because they started building rectangular, didn't, didn't mean they stopped using the round or constructing round buildings too. Um, we have um, lithics from these buildings um, that we more or less excavated. I mean, they were started by Klaus Schmidt. We finished the excavations. And we have, uh, of course, the uh, various evidence from or material recovered from these buildings or from this building in particular. This is um, uh, some of the lithics, which will have generally been looked at for the first time in the past few years by uh, Jonas Schlindwein, who's doing his PhD. Um, and these are showing a considerable concentration of, uh, of, of lithics in these rooms. When, but it seems to be that this is a, a mixed inventory assemblage, PPNA and PPNB, and uh, also typical of domestic activity. So it looks like they're being used as midden areas afterwards and things are sort of floating in and uh, washing in. Um, and as you can see from the uh, assemblage itself, um, it does speak in favor of uh, domestic activity. I'm hurrying a bit because I think my time is uh, uh, running out. But um, here again, we have uh, another interesting uh, rectangular building here. This is this building here. But it's actually a tight building, which you can see repeated at various uh, parts of the site around the main excavation area. Um, and if we look at the uh, this schematic uh, sort of drawing that we have here by my colleague Moritz Kinzer, who's doing the building archaeology of Ekitepe, we can see a uh, standardization perhaps. We have this uh, platform at one end with a T-pillar. We have a floor, a lime plaster floor. We have a niche here in, in one of the corners. Uh, frequently in the roof claps, we have these uh, stone frames, uh, windows or, or entry portals, you might call them, um, uh, for a ladder. Um, perhaps associated with this niche, we don't know. We have possible evidence for an upper story. Um, so what we're actually seeing here is that these are not, as previously put forward by Klaus Schmidt, also ritual buildings, but we think that these are moving towards domestic. So domestic buildings, but also with a ritual function. So perhaps with a, you know, the, 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 the cellar or the being uh, more uh, of a ritual function, an upper story um, for the more domestic chores. And of course, to go along with that, we have our first burial because, of course, a domestic site needs its burials. We have one burial so far, um, and this was found also in a drainage channel constructed to the south of the main excavation area for the water drainage, rainwater drainage at the main shelter. And here we found this wonderful sort of uh, kidney-shaped pit um, in the floor of a, of a PPMB rectangular structure. Three individuals were found in there, um, uh, a female, two females and one male or female. Um, and here, uh, the material, uh, the, the bones, which are now being looked at by my colleague, Julia Gleski, um, from Berlin. Um, water. They, they had water. We know that they must have water to live at the site. Um, these are sh more or less showing the drainage of the water from the site. The main site is in here. A lot going towards the west. These little dots, pink dots here, or purple dots. I'm also colorblind. Um, uh, 
showing systems or channels carved into the limestone plateau. Um, but most, and these are a few examples of those uh, channels and pits and systems, um, although it's always to date them to the Neolithic. We've done that recently, uh, we've excavated one of them, and we had um, a collective sort of a collection of bones, uh, human bones, which appear to uh, show scratch marks and which appear to be Neolithic in dates. So and I think using those would actually date at least one of these systems to the Neolithic, which is uh, quite a nice thing. So they were using, they were, they were actually harvesting the rainwater um, at Gobekli Tepe. And more recently, of course, we have finds from here, or features from here, it's two and three, again, these deep soundings. We have a wonderful channel uh, carved, really on site, carved, which was covered originally by limestone slabs. And uh, this is here in this pit and over here in KTN 55, this trench over here, we have a wonderful system or possible system um, which uh, is eight meters in diameter and about three meters deep into the natural limestone. And around the top, this isn't actually walling, this is a sort of ballast to hold down slabs. And it looks very much that we have the th first three or four courses of a corporate roofing, um, which is quite remarkable for this early uh, period. So um, that's something that we're um, trying to publish as soon as possible because, uh, uh, yeah, for obvious reasons. <clears throat> Coming to the special buildings, um, we also realised that the limestone plateau was probably uh, stepped, um, whether naturally or artificially due to, uh, through quarrying, could be both. Um, and the, the height of the mound itself isn't actually 15 metres. Um, perhaps the archaeological deposits are a lot thinner, but we have this underlying stepped limestone plateau, which you can see also on surrounding hills in the region. And then we have another reconstruction here by Moritz Kinzer, um, showing then uh, how this process may have taken place with these domestic structures quite nearby, which we have evidence for as well. Looking at the older documentation by Klaus Schmidt, we have good, ev good evidence now of PPNA domestic structures very much um, next to and adjacent to these monumental or special buildings. Regarding the special buildings, we know now that they are uh, multi-phase buildings um, and combined with radiocarbon evidence that they were long-lived buildings. This is showing building B with different colours. Interesting is that the outer building, the outer colour, is the oldest phase of the, of, the, of the building and in the course of time they rebuilt inside the next one, so a bit like these Russian dolls, always one inside the other, and the inner circle uh, being the youngest phase of this building. Uh, and the reasons for this, I think, probably actually the pressure from the slope adjacent, because we're in a dip, as, a, as I said, and the pressure coming from the surrounding slopes was causing damage to the original buildings, and one way of actually preserving those buildings for use at the time was to put another building within it and supporting and trying to stop any uh, slide of the sediments surrounding. And that's backed up by radiocarbon data here, for example, from building D, um, which uh, shows two clusters, one uh, in the PPNA and one in PPNB. We have a problem with the plateau here. Um, but what we're seeing is that this actually corresponds to uh, the phases of the building as well, where we have uh, on the western side mainly early PPNB dates from the ninth, mid 9th millennium and then older dates over here in this wall um, from the PPNA. So we have really a, a structure, and all of these structures, um, A, B, C, D, so far, show evidence that they were in use or first founded or, or, or built in or their earliest phases were in the PPNA and that actually weren't abandoned until the early or middle PPNB, possibly even. Um, how were they filled? Well, as I said, we don't think they were richly buried, buried anymore. Rather, we think that we were dealing with um, slope erosion. So if we have a building um, that is actually early PPNB, still in existence, and we have these rectangular structures up here, at some point the slope gave way and they more or less slipped into the monumental buildings, into the special buildings. Um, so not as we previously presumed. And of course, this has a lot of implications for our interpretation of the site now, especially when it comes to feasting, because previously where it said, you know, all of these animal bones were coming from feasting events, now we know they were probably just displaced middens from further up the slope. So everything relativised. Um, regarding the beer, um, you know, a few years back there were these positive analyses for fermentation from these uh, limestone vessels which belonged to the early PPMB phase or into in rectangular structures but we haven't actually been able to reproduce these uh, results since then. So also we have to see that in a very tentative way. Um, and here you can see the, the backfill as well, which is stratified. So this is what we see now. This is the old reconstruction. 
This is a new reconstruction that we can see now in the visitor centre. Um, so instead of seeing a, an intentionally backfilled monumental building at a solely ritual site, now we're seeing uh, a reconstruction of a settlement, um, a possibly a flourishing settlement uh, you know, in, the, in the early PPMB, in the PPMB, with these um, contemporaneous but much older, uh, with much older histories, um, monumental or special building structures. So to summarise all of that, um, I think we have to consider Gebeki Tepe in a whole new light. It's no longer, as I say, this ritual site. It's not the zero point in time. It's not the home of the first temples. It's a settlement with a, a series of long-lived and very impressive monumental buildings, which, you know, in spite of, in spite of this new development, are very much uh, you know, uh, worth being on the UNESCO World Heritage List. Um, there's lots I haven't spoken to, uh, about today about the symbolism, but I think that's perhaps for another talk. So uh, thank you very much.